Okay, let's take let's take a look at today's questions. Number one, what do you think Gonzalo's ideal society says about attitudes toward civilization at that time? Nobody took this question, so let's look at it together. Now I need to open the play. Where is it? There it is. What was it? Two, one, one, four, six. Okay, so Antonio and his people have just landed on this island. They think that nobody lives here, that it's a useless island. And so uh, Gonzalo, to try to cheer up Antonio, imagines his version of the perfect society. So starting here, had I plantation of this isle, my lord, if I were to develop this island, And were the king on it, what would I do? In the Commonwealth, I would, by contraries, execute all things. So in terms of governing the country, I would do things exactly the opposite to how we do them now. For no kind of traffic would I admit. I would not allow anyone to come to this country. No name of magistrate. Uh, I would not take the name of the leader of magistrate. Letters should not be known. I will not teach people to read. Riches, poverty, and use of service, none. So no money and no payment for services. Contract, succession, born, bound of land, tilth, vineyard, none. So no laws of contract, no laws of secession, no land boundaries, no taxes, no vineyards, none of that stuff. No use of metal, corn, wine, oil. Uh, corn here isn't just corn. Corn here means bread. No occupation. All men idle. All. And women too. But innocent and pure. So, so far, his vision of the ideal society is nobody does anything. All things in common nature should produce without sweat or endeavor. So basically, he's promoting communism. Uh, we should share everything from nature. We shouldn't work for it. Treason, felony, sword, pike, knife, gun, or need of any engine would I not have. So in my ideal society, there would be no treason or betrayal to the country. There would be no felony or serious crime. There would be no weapons or any engine. Engine here means an engine of war or like a, um, a machine used for war, like a catapult or like a battering ram. But nature should bring forth of its own kind all poison, all abundance to feed my innocent people. So instead, we will entirely depend on nature uh, to eat and to live, and we will therefore have a lot. Where are we going with this? 171. I would with such perfection govern, sir, to excel the golden age. And so this society would be so perfect that it would be even better than the classical era. So 
So what could this say about attitudes towards civilization at that time? Well, Gonzalo proposes a perfect society where there is no civilization. There is no work, there's no society, there's no crime, and everybody depends on nature. Perhaps he does this as he says, it is the opposite of everything that we have now. So all of the things that he mentions, whether it's uh, bread or iron or laws and taxes or treason and weapons, all of these things exist now and he would want none of them. So it looks like uh, Gonzalo's idea would only make sense if a significant part of the audience agreed with his ideas. And so we can say that maybe his vision is one way that people of that time thought about civilization. And their thinking, I guess, is that civilization is a bad idea. Yes, we have better technology, but we have to pay taxes. We have to suffer through war. If you add it all up, civilization is not worth it. We should all just go into nature and live off the land. Uh, the second part of this question, do you think Shakespeare agrees? Why or why not? Um, well, so this question is asking about the author's attitude toward his character's ideas. Not everything that a character says will represent the author's own ideas. So we should look at how the play treats Gonzalo. Does it think that Gonzalo is a person with good ideas? Well, if we look at what people say in between his ideas, he says, had I planned, hey, if I were to develop this island, and Antonio says to somebody else, he'd sow it with nettle seed. He would develop it using wild plants or weeds. Yetal. And Sebastian replies, or docks or mallows. Um, also weeds. So they're kind of making fun of him. They're saying that he doesn't know how to develop uh, civilization. Uh, and then he later he says, uh, Gonzalo asks, if I were king, what would I do? And Sebastian replies, escape being drunk for want of wine. Uh, if you were king, you would not be able to be drunk because you wouldn't have the wine. In other words, you would be such a terrible king that you couldn't even provide wine. Escape here means escape. Then Gonzalo gives a picture of the society with nothing. And Sebastian says, yet he would be king on it. All right, he says, no sovereignty. There would be no absolute ruler. There would be no king. And Sebastian says, but he just said he would be king of this place. And Antonio says, the latter end of his commonwealth forgets the beginning. This is a, a pun. Literally, it means... When you get to the end of his kingdom, you forget the beginning. But what he's really saying is Gonzalo has forgotten what he said at the beginning. So it looks like the other characters don't really agree with his ideas. They keep making fun of him. So from this, maybe we can say that Shakespeare knows some people think like this but he himself does not agree because he doesn't present it as a good idea. He presents it as an, an idea that other people mock. Question two, this one was a popular question. Let's take a look. Three, one. No, we're still on two. We go three, one, three, four. Okay, so at this point, uh, 
Prospero has realized that Ferdinand and Miranda have fallen in love, but as we mentioned last week, he thinks that their relationship is going too fast. So he tries to slow it down. And what he does is he locks Ferdinand in a room full of wood and he says, you can only marry my daughter after you have finished chopping all of this wood. So Ferdinand is now busy cutting wood. And he says, there be some sports are painful. A sport is a game. So some games are hard. And their labor delight in them sets off. Delight is the object of this sentence. This sotsi. So labor sets off delight in them. He's saying that these games that are hard are fun precisely because we have to work hard at these games. The labor, the working hard makes the games delightful or fun. Some kinds of baseness are nobly undergone. Some low things, things we don't want to do that we do not think we should do. When we have to do them, they are done quite well. Uh, in Chinese, this might be And most poor matters point to rich ends. Many of these base things produce noble results. So do you agree with this idea is the question. Uh, some, well, two groups took this question and they both said yes, but for quite different reasons. So one group thinks that this makes sense. Uh, some of the stuff we don't want to do can give a good result. Uh, and they say yes, because in this context, Ferdinand is trying to encourage himself. He doesn't want to chop wood, but he keeps telling himself, I'm chopping this wood so that I can marry the love of my life. And in fact, by encouraging himself, he is actively giving meaning to his actions. It is because of his love that he's doing this, and therefore this action is no longer base is no longer meaningless. It is a worthy thing to do. The other group gave a different reason. They also think, yes, that doing stuff we don't want to do can have good results, but they say it's because we cannot predict the future. We don't know whether this thing that looks meaningless now will always be meaningless or whether one day it will be useful. So, for example, um, if you have to write a report in your company and nobody is going to read the report, it looks meaningless. You're writing it for nobody. But one day the company might get into trouble and they might need your report to help solve the situation. You don't know. Um, so even things that look like they're meaningless may one day discover their meaning. Uh, of course, the opposite view would be some things really are meaningless. You do it for no good reason just because somebody asked you to do it and it won't help anybody. But I think the first way of looking at the world is more hopeful. In life, we will have to do many things we don't want to do. Uh, and it, it will be impossible to avoid doing them. So I think the more useful way to think about it is maybe it's not meaningless. Maybe we can find a meaning for it or we can imagine a meaning for it in the future. And that way it will help us to finish this boring thing. Question three, right next door. What do you think this line means? One group took this question. Here it is. These sweet thoughts do even refresh my labors. Most busy, lest when I do it. So the first half, 
the thoughts of marrying Miranda make my work, uh, give my work more energy. It refreshes me. It makes it so that this work is not so tiring. And then the question, most busy less when I do it. Uh, there's a footnote, actually. This is line 15. This is the first half of line 15. The second half of line 15 is here. And then we have a footnote. And the footnote says, notice the parentheses. The parentheses means that this is an interpretation by the editor. It's not a translation, it's not an explanation. It's a subjective interpretation. Ferdinand seems to say that the busier he is, the less likely he is to forget the sweet thoughts that make his labors pleasant. In other words, the harder that he works, the more he will keep in mind the romantic reason why he is working. And the footnote continues, the line may be in need of emendation. What does that mean, emendation? Emendation means a correction by the editor, but it's not an objective correction. When we discover the text of a Shakespeare play, usually we only have uh, one or two different versions. And so if something in the play doesn't make sense, we don't have a so-called correct version to compare and to make changes. The editor has to make a guess about what this part means and is there a way to change the line so that it makes more sense. So actually this question is not very fair for you because it's saying, do, do you think the editor's explanation of this line makes sense? If not, could you give another explanation or is there a way to change this line to make it make more sense? Uh, the group that took this question concluded that the explanation does make sense. And the way that they understand this seemingly nonsensical line is that when it says most busy, lest when I do it, lest means for fear of that. Even today, we use the word lest, yi fang. Uh, so they would understand this line to mean, I keep myself very busy for fear that when I do this work, I forget the reason I'm doing it. Uh, and I think that makes sense. So like when we read Shakespeare's plays, he has a very flexible use of language. There are many places we have to uh, use similar meanings or we have to imagine the situation or we have to guess from the root of the word, things like that. So I think this is acceptable in terms of Shakespearean use of language. It adds a little bit of meaning, uh, but it is still understandable. Um, but this question is supposed to make you think about the fact that uh, the play that we're reading is not the perfect, complete version. There has always been something added or changed by the editor, and the editor is human. The editor is probably not as genius as Shakespeare. Um, so when you read something that doesn't quite make sense, we can always think about is there another way to make sense of it? Um, we talked about something similar in Much Ado About Nothing. During the party scene, there is a part where the stage directions say, like, this person dances with that person. And we talked about whether that makes sense or whether it should be another person in the dance. The same spirit. Question four, how would you perform Ariel's first three lines in 3-2? Nobody took this question, so let's look at it together. In 
Act Three, Scene Two. We are following Caliban, Stefano, and Trinculo, these three fools, as they wander around the island drunk. Ariel is here. Enter Ariel Invisible. So he's observing what they do. Uh, and if anything important happens, he will go report it to Prospero. But Ariel sometimes talks. For example, here. What line is this? Line, I'm going to say 44. He mimics Trinculo. So he, he sounds like Trinculo and he says, Thou liest. You lie. Well, Caliban is saying, as I told thee before, I am subject to a tyrant, a sorcerer that by his cunning hath cheated me of the island. So he is again complaining that Prospero used his magic to steal the island away from him. And Ariel calls him a liar, but he uses Trinculo's voice. And so Caliban thinks that it was Trinculo who said you liar and he replies to Trinculo angrily. Later on, Ariel does the same thing, mimicking Trinculo, thou liest, thou canst not. Uh, here Caliban is saying, ye, ye, my lord, yes, yes. I'll yield him thee asleep, thee is Prospero, where thou mayst knock a nail into his head. So he's saying, yes, I will give you Prospero while he's asleep, and so you can kill him by knocking a nail into his head. And Ariel uses Trinculo's voice to say, you liar, you can't do it. And then Caliban again gets angry. Third time, same thing. Uh, now they're arguing about did Trinculo call Caliban a liar? Trinculo says, what? Uh, why? What did I? I did nothing. I'll go farther off. If you don't trust me, I'll walk away over there. Stefano, didst thou not say he lied? Didn't you just say that Caliban is a liar? And then Ariel says in Trinculo's voice, Thou liest. Now he's calling Stefano a liar. Stefano, do I lie? Do I so? Take thou that. He beats Trinculo. So Ariel has caused a fight between Trinculo and Stefano. So the question is, in these three lines, how would you make Ariel perform? What would you ask the actor to do? Well, it says that Ariel is invisible, right? So the characters can't see him. But obviously the audience can see him. Otherwise, we would have no idea what's going on. So we know that it is Ariel using Trinculo's voice. But how would you make him perform this situation so that the actors would uh, plausibly believe that it was Trinculo talking and not Ariel. Uh, if you notice, um, in these three lines, Trinculo does not seem to hear the voice. So like Caliban and Stefano hear Ariel, but Trinculo does not. It's a very interesting situation. So perhaps one way to do this, so. Uh, that means that the most obvious way to do this probably would not make sense, which is to have Ariel stand behind Trinculo or stand next to Trinculo to deliver these lines. That would not make sense because if he's standing next to Trinculo, then Trinculo would hear him. But he does not hear him. So another way to do this might be um, at those moments to move Trinculo somewhere on stage, make him move, give him something to do uh, so that when Ariel speaks in his voice, uh, Trinculo is too busy to notice, but the other people notice. Another way to do this might be to actually have the actor playing Trinculo say these lines. And instead, just ask Ariel to perform 
the idea that he's talking. So it's kind of like lip syncing, right? Ariel is performing, but the actor playing Trinculo is actually the person who's saying the words. And so in this case, at those moments, we would have Trinculo like with his back to the audience so that the audience does not see the fact that he is not actually talking or the audience does not see the fact that he actually is talking. Uh, or maybe, you know, you can find a very talented actor to do some ventriloquism. Ventriloquism is when you make your voice appear somewhere else. I wonder what that's called in Chinese. Ventriloquism. Fool. Yes. So maybe we can have uh, the actor playing Trinculo use some ventriloquism. Fool. Uh, and make his voice appear from wherever Ariel is standing. Or I guess the simple way to do this is just to uh, pretend like Trinculo can't hear Ariel, even when Ariel is right next to him. Um, in any case, the audience will always be able to see Ariel, and so they will think that this scene is quite funny. Uh, it's Ariel like toying with the other characters. Um, but the way the different ways to do this uh, reveal how much realism you're willing to use for this scene. 不同的安排方式显现不同的就是写实程度. And then question five. Uh, this was also quite a popular question. I had two groups take this question. Uh, how would you make the food disappear while keeping the table? 3352. Okay, so in this scene, Antonio's group discovers a table of food in the middle of the island and they are enjoying the food, but then like uh, Ariel and his helpers. Who, you know, put the food there in the first place, then suddenly take the food away. So. Let's see, this is Alonzo talking. I'm going to eat it. Stand to and do as we. So get up and do what we do. They approach the table. They're just going to eat. Suddenly, thunder and lightning. Special effects. Enter Ariel like a harpy. A harpy is a person with wings. Um, think about angels. The way that we think about angels today, that kind of creature is actually a harpy. If you read the Bible, the, uh, the real angel is actually a terrifying creature. Actually, you know, that might be fun. Let me show you what an angel actually looks like. So these are some depictions of what an angel actually looks like uh, from the Bible. Nothing like what we imagine. So. But in any case, just think of Ariel with wings, right? Claps his wings upon the table, and with a quaint device, the banquet vanishes. A quaint device just means a special trick. So this question is asking, what kind of trick would you use? One group says, well, because Ariel has wings and he uses his wings to hit the table. So why don't we make the food using paper? Like we can cut out paper and in the shape of food and we can stand it on the table. So when Ariel claps his wings, the wind blows the food away. And because it's paper, so when it hits the ground, it will be flat and nobody can see it. I think that's a very Interesting way to do this, and it fits with the play very well. The other group said, well, we can use a trick table. We have a table that's actually a desk. There is a space under the table, and we cover the table 
using a tablecloth so that nobody can see that extra space. And when Ariel uses his wings to hit the table, he activates some kind of mechanism so that the surface of the table goes into the compartment. And therefore, it will look like the food has disappeared. It's kind of like an electronic mahjong table, uh, and that would also be possible even in the 16th century. You don't need electricity to build that kind of tool. I think that is a brilliant idea. If they could find somebody to make this trick table, it would be a really great idea. Um, and then, of course, those are traditional ways in the 16th century, in the 17th century. What about today? Well, uh, one group said today, maybe we can use a projector, toying ji. You have the table. You have a screen behind the table, right next to the table, and you can project pictures of food onto the screen. And so when the food disappears, you just turn off the projector and it looks like the food is gone. And if you have enough, uh, if you have enough money, you can even use a hologram, a 3D projector, Sandy Toy, which would be even more entertaining. Um, so there are a number of ways to do this. The point here is that Shakespeare does not tell you how to do this. And this shows us the gap between a written play and a performed play. So, for example, uh, when I was in New York City, I went to see the Harry Potter play. Did you guys know this? Harry Potter has a play, a stage version. You know? Does Harry Potter have a stage version? You know? So the question, of course, is how do you do magic on stage? Um, and they used a lot of uh, traditional magicians' tricks. Sometimes they used wires, and sometimes they used a projector. As long as it looks special, as long as it looks like magic, there are many different ways to do it. Uh, by the way, the Harry Potter play is not very good. It's very entertaining, but the story is terrible. Uh, OK, so those are the discussion questions today. Do you have any questions about them? OK, so for next week, please finish the play. Ah, bring um, it Next week, we will also. Ooh, next week, we will also introduce the final exam, yes. Because the schedule is kind of weird. Let me show you. So. Week 17, no class, uh, January 1st. If we begin the exam on week 18. I have to submit the grades on Thursday of week 19. Which means you would have one week from Monday week 18 to Monday week 19 to do the exam, and then I would have two days to mark the exam and one day and half a day to upload the grades. Uh, I don't want to rush. So instead, the final exam will begin on week 16. Uh, until the end of January 1st. It's also one week. And then on week 18, we're just going to come and read some sonnets and have some fun. No pressure. So next week, read uh, Act 4 and 5, finish the play, and then I will talk about the final exam, and then you will have the chance to begin actually doing the final exam. Where is it? Yes, starting on Christmas. Oh, I give you an extra day because of the New Year Day, because of the holiday. So the exam will run from next Monday after class to January 2nd, which is Tuesday, midnight.
OK, so let's take a look at Act 4. This is page 1594. Enter Prospero, Ferdinand and Miranda. Prospero. If I have too austerely punished you, austere means serious. If I have too seriously punished you, your compensation makes amends. Uh, what you get for this punishment is the compensation for the punishment. And of course, what he gets is Miranda. So Miranda is your compensation. For I have given you here a third of mine own life or that for which I live. Why one third? Uh, because he's saying that Miranda has been part of my life for one third of my life. Uh, this tells us Prospero is 45. Miranda, we learned in Act 1, is 15. So if she is one third of his life, then Prospero is currently 45 years old. And she is also my reason for living, that for which I live. Who once again I tender to thy hand, so I give her away to you. Uh, we, in English today, we still use the word tender to mean give. Uh, but usually we only use it when somebody is resigning. They tender their resignation. I'm a decent All thy vexations were but my trials of thy love. So all of your troubles, vexations, were only my tests of your love. And thou hast strangely stood the test. Stood here means withstood, so withstand. Strangely here does not is not a bad word. Strange just means amazing in Shakespeare's time. So you have amazingly passed the test. Here afore heaven, so before heaven. In front of heaven. I ratify this my rich gift. I confirm that I am giving you Miranda. Oh, Ferdinand, do not smile at me that I boast her off. For thou shalt find she will outstrip all praise and make it halt behind her. So don't laugh because I praise my daughter so highly. You will find that she is much better than all of this praise. And in fact, will make all of this praise stop behind her. Outstrip means run faster than. So she will run so fast in front of her praise that it will make it look like all of her praises have stopped behind her. That's how good she is. Ferdinand, I do believe it against an oracle. Against here means according to. Oracle is prophecy or like pronouncement. So he's saying because you say it, therefore I believe it. Then as my gift in thine own acquisition worthily purchased, take my daughter. But if thou dost break her virgin not before all sanctimonious ceremonies may with full and holy right be ministered. No sweet aspersion shall the heavens let fall to make this contract grow. So if you have sex with her before the marriage ceremony. Minister here means administer. Then no blessing. Will the heavens give you. To make this agreement grow, in other words, to make this marriage prosperous. In other words, if you have sex with her before you marry her, you will not have children. Prospero is here cursing him. But barren hate, barren means unfertile, like not having children. Barren hate, sour eyed disdain, contempt, and discord, which is the opposite of harmony. Shall bestrew the union of your bed 
with weeds so loathly that you shall hate it both. So if you have sex before you get married, you will have an unhappy marriage and you will hate each other. Therefore, take heed, so pay attention. As Hymen's lamps shall light you. Hymen is the goddess of marriage. And that's why we have this word in English, Hymen as the barrier in a woman's body before she has sex. Chunimor. That's where this word comes from. And of course, Ferdinand agrees. Uh, nothing shall melt mine honor into lust. Nothing will make me disregard my honor in order to fulfill my lust. Uh, and then after the marriage has been agreed on. Remember, they don't have a priest. They can't. Actually get married on this island. They can only be engaged. So after the engagement has been agreed on. Prospero calls Ariel. And asks Ariel to perform. Um, to give a performance. And if I remember correctly. It's called a pageant. Uh, no, no, they don't call it a pageant, but the idea of this performance is that Ariel and some of his magical co-workers put on the clothing of. What is it? Uh, the gods and goddesses, and they give a performance that is kind of like a wedding blessing to Ferdinand and Miranda. And there's music, soft music. But again, we don't know what this music sounds like. You'll have to imagine the music for yourself. So we have some of these goddesses. Iris. In ancient Greece, this would be Hermes, the messenger god. And it's also the. Uh, the goddess of the rainbow. Ceres, which in ancient Greece is Persephone, the goddess of uh, fertile bounty. The, the new sense. So like the goddess of farming and growth. Of course, here growth means the growth of a new child. Uh, and then we have Juno. Who in ancient Greece is Hera, Zeus's wife. And she is the goddess of uh, marital harmony, the goddess of husband and wife. So Hymen is the goddess of the marriage ceremony. Juno is the goddess of the, the marriage um, union, bond. And they do a performance. Um, let's see. But in the middle of this performance, Prospero suddenly says, oh, wait, I had forgot that foul conspiracy of the beast Caliban and his, and his confederates against my life. The minute of their plot is almost come. And so he says to the uh, magical performers, well done, avoid, no more, so go away. Um, so here Prospero remembers that Caliban is going to try to kill him, and he needs to take care of that. And so that's what the rest of this scene will be about. When I saw this play in London, uh, they got real opera singers to do this performance. It was beautiful. Uh, and then like the song is about the fruitfulness of nature, about how all plants grow and the beauty of life. And so what they did was they used the projector to give us pictures of like trees growing and flowers growing while these three opera singers wore beautiful dresses to sing about the beauty of life. It was really good. Um, so, you know, just because it says music doesn't mean you just have to grab three ordinary people to sing that you can make it more special if you want. OK, let's stop here. Please finish the play before next week. <laughs>